phone and all of these lovely people are right here. Look at them all. Wave. Yay. Okay. So we are here reviewing. Let's see if I can get it back. There. We are here reviewing AP Bio. Oh, it was unit two. Um, is it already seizing? Please don't seize yet. Um, AP Bio unit two, cell structure and function. Okay, and we are following the college board exactly, right? So that we can get fives on our AP exams. Am I back in the right place? All right, so in this uh, particular unit for us, um, we had, okay, go. Sorry, delay of game. We had for us, we had, um, we had chapter four and we had chapter five. Is all of it sounding familiar? Mm -hmm. Chapter four was all about the cell, right? And we talked about the cell theory. We talked about prokaryotic cells versus eukaryotic cells, right? That's what we focused there. So take a quick minute and just, you're not going to have time to highlight everything, but try to hit some of it. Did we determine it was better with the light on or light off? I can't remember. Light off. Light off. You're going to fall asleep because you're tired? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. And if I'm ever out, we just say, yeah, okay. All right. So that was chapter four. And really, chapter four is not that hard, right? Other than learning the organelles and some of their functions, that was probably the only hard part to chapter four. Um, but then we moved on to chapter five, right? And that was all about membranes and transport, okay? So maybe look through some of those and get familiar with it. And remember we had a little math in this one, right? Because we learned how to calculate water potential. Oh, yeah. Chunks of potato. Yeah. So this was the Remember osmosis? So fun. All right. Glance over them so you get an idea. Okay. You good? Because you can read this on your own time, right? Because you know I'll post it, right? Are we good? Can I keep going? Okay. So then we moved into uh, um, the FRQs. And remember, I spelled out a bunch of different FRQs that you could do. She could sit in my office. Oh, oh, perfect. Would that be good? Sorry, That's okay. Hi, sweetheart. Okay, so um, these are the FRQs. Some of these would be really good to review because I spelled them all out. Remember, isn't this the one where you got to take a partner test too? Yeah. So this is the one that you don't have a really good read on because you did it with somebody else. So I would definitely spend a little extra time here to make sure you understand it individually, okay? All right, I'm going to move on from that because you will have that. So the first part is the cell theory. All living things are made of cells. They're the structural and functional unit of life. And cells only come from pre-existing cells. What do we know about cells? They are very, very what? And they are very, very small because we want a large surface area per volume. And we talked about even how we could calculate surface area to volume, right? And remember, if you look at your equation sheet for the college board, they tell you how to do it for a, a square, a rectangle, a circle, and just do the math, right? You'll have a calculator, do the math, take the surface area, divide it by the volume, and then you have the surface area to volume number, and you can compare and contrast. Cells that are thinner, right, are going to have larger, what, surface area to volume. Cells that are thick are going to have less surface area to volume, yes? Okay. And then we went in and started talking about prokaryotic cells and their structures. If we started um, just looking at this picture, this looks like it came out of a hairbrush blue stuff. What is that? DNA. DNA, but we would call it a chromosome, right? It's a chromosome. And remember, prokaryotic cells have a single circular chromosome, right? We don't talk about haploid or diploid because they only have one. So if you did it technically, it would be haploid. Does that make sense? Okay. Could they have additional DNA? Yes. What is that additional DNA called? Plasmid. Little extra rings of DNA. And genetic, uh, you know, engineers like to manipulate that. 
All right, do they have any membrane enclosed organelles? Nope. No. What do you call the area like the great lawn where the DNA hangs out though? Nucleoid, Nucleoid region. region. Do they have ribosomes? Yeah. Yes, but that's not a membrane enclosed organelle, right? What is a ribosome made out of? Proteins and rRNA, right? And what are ribosomes used for? Protein synthesis. Protein synthesis. Good. Um, do you want to send around my blue pen for signing in? But please, can I have it back because I really like it? Okay, so ribosomes are for protein synthesis. Now, what is our first layer? And it's always our first layer, no matter what cell you have. What is that first layer? Cell membrane. And the cell membrane decides what goes and what goes. Good. And what are cell membranes composed of? Phospholipid bilayer, right? And interspersed within them are what? proteins. We have a whole chapter just talking about membranes and how they function like that, right? And then right outside of our cell membrane is a cell wall. And it depends on what kind of organism you are, what your cell wall is made out of, right? What is it for bacteria? Peptidioglycan, right? We kind of, what is it for plant cells? Cellulose. What is it for fungal cells? There you go. All right, and then what on the outside right here, you have some sort of carbohydrate, right? It could be hard like a shell, or it could be goopy. But the things extending out, what are those called? They help attach. What are those called? Fimbriae. Fimbriae, right? Fimbriae help the bacteria to attach. And then some of them, not in this picture, it's labeled, it looks just like the same, but they use it for a little something, something. What is that called? Sex pili. And they can exchange DNA that way for conjugation, to exchange that DNA. And by exchanging DNA, what are you increasing? Variety. Your variety. And why would I want to increase my variety? I might acquire some new, what? Starts with an A? Adaptations. You're so smart, right? Which increases my overall fitness. Good. Yay. Okay, so then we looked at some specifics about what you might find inside. Okay, so we have sex pillows here, fimbriae. Oh, I didn't mention this guy. What's that guy for? Flagellin. and he's for what? Mm -hmm. Movement. We have, don't worry about inclusion bodies. Mesosomes does increase surface area. Ribosome we got, nucleoid, plasma membrane, cell wall, glycocalyx. Perfect. What's right down here? What's this? Archaea. Archaea. Is archaea prokaryotic? Yes. What are the three domains? Eukarya, archaea, 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 bacteria. Good. So archaea is still prokaryotic, but it is more closely related in some structures to what? Eukaryotes. Okay, good. Perfect. All right. And then we compared, are we going? Yeah. We compared and contrasted prokaryotic cells with eukaryotic cells and what it means. But the, the big ticket item you want to remember is membrane closed organelles. Is this prokaryote drawn to, drawn to scale? No, what size would he normally be? Okay, perfect. And then endosymbiotic hypothesis, it'd be the evolution. Okay. Okay, sorry. One moment, though. Would be the evolution of a eukaryotic cell from a prokaryotic cell. And so the idea would be that one prokaryote went and what? Engulfed another prokaryotic cell and made it its organelle. And the two organelles that we would say are the mitochondria and chloroplast. And our, our evidence for that is that mitochondria and chloroplast have their own. They are self-replicating. They replicate like through binary fission, just like bacteria do. Of the DNA they have, it's a single circular chromosome, which is just like prokaryotes. They have their own ribosomes, and their ribosomes are more like those of prokaryotic cells. Also, they have double membranes. Remember all of that? So that's our evidence that probably um, chloroplasts and mitochondria were once free-living prokaryotic cells. Then we know there are three ways to cross a cell membrane, right? What are the three ways to cross a cell membrane? You can go through the phospholipid bilayer. You can use a channel or a carrier or whole membrane, which would be endocytosis and exocytosis. So 
We know endocytosis, you come in with that cell membrane, yes? Mm -hmm. And so that cell membrane who had done endocytosis could have worked its way around the nucleoid region in order to form a what? Nucleus and the whole endomembrane system. And by endomembrane system, I'm talking about how the nuclear envelope is continuous in a eukaryotic cell, is continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. First, the <coughs> rough and then the smooth. smooth. And then where do things go after the ER? They go to the Golgi, Golgi which is like the UPS. UPS man, right? And then they can leave the Golgi and either be packaged for exocytosis or stay within the cell. So that would be the endomembrane system, and it could have come about from that infolding. Okay. Now, if a membrane, a membrane is how many layers? Two. It's a phospholipid. So if I pinch in like this, each of these layers is two layers, right? So technically, how many layers would I have? Four, right? That's what you have around the nucleus. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So then that is the endosymbiotic hypothesis. You're so slow. Okay, domains, we already went over these domains, so you feel comfortable with that, yeah? All right. And then it's just kind of being really comfortable with the eukaryotic cell versus the prokaryotic cell. And what you want to focus on with your brain is that this compartmentalization that you see in a eukaryotic cell, because they are larger, they are sacrificing some of the what? Surface area to volume. But the trade for them is the compartmentalization. And that within each of these membrane enclosed structures, you can have specialization. You can set aside an area to do specific reactions. You can protect your DNA from other things that are coming in. All right. So when you look at a eukaryotic cell, you want to think things like specialization, like what does it do? You want to look at flow of information, right? Because that's important. That's one of our big ideas, how the information inside the nucleus gets out, right? The DNA, you get a message from the DNA and you make what? mRNA, right? So the mRNA is what leaves the nucleus. And then that mRNA goes out and gets on a what? Ribosome. Ribosome. And there it gets translated into a protein. Okay, but we never had to compromise the integrity of the DNA because it stayed within the, what, mm -hmm. nucleus. But yet we got our protein products, right? And then now as we're doing genetics, this is the genotype. And then what you build on the ribosome would be the what? Genotype. Got it? Okay, so that's that flow of information out. And then you want to start comparing and contrasting like between a, like a plant cell, and an animal cell, how are they different, right? We know animal cells do cellular respiration, and they do that in the what? Do they do all of their cellular respiration in the mitochondria? No. What? Glycolysis. And where does that occur? In the cytoplasm, right? Okay. Now, does it mean if you're a prokaryotic cell that you can't do aerobic respiration with a transition prep, Krebs cycle, ETC? No, you still can, but it's not compartmentalized. It's not set aside and you're doing it just right here. You're still using membranes, but you don't have that specialization. All right. And then we look at things like what's the difference? Okay. And we look at a plant cell. It still has mitochondria, but it has another organelle. It has a chloroplast. It has lost the centrioles. It still has a microtubule organizing center or a centrosome. Remember where the microtubules radiate out? Asters. It still has the asters. It just doesn't have the centrioles sitting inside of it. Okay. It has a cell wall around it. And then it has a large central vacuole. But that's adaptive for a plant because a plant wants to fill up that large central vacuole with what? Water, Water to push against the cell wall, right? So that it has that rigidity. And when the cell wall pushes back, what do we call that? Turgor pressure. Turgor pressure. And that prevents a plant cell from bursting in a mm, environment. Water must flow from the hypo. So it would be flowing from a hypotonic environment into the plant, which would be considered hypertonic if you were worried about the cell bursting. Are you okay with that? All right, perfect. Okay, um, next, 
um, is just kind of looking at that endomembrane system and the flow of information between the nucleus, the ER, and the Golgi. And we can talk about lysosomes being the stomach of the cell and how you can use that. Oh, perfect. Did everybody sign in okay? Sweetheart, would you mind? It just needs to go on that table back over there. Thank you, of course. Um, this is what is referred to as the endomembrane system. Then we look at those energy organelles. Okay, and then we had another peak at evolution. And those same microtubules, oh, thank you, sweetheart. Those same microtubules that go across the cell during mitosis, right, to help the chromosomes separate, the sister chromatids separate from each other or the homologous pairs. Oh, when would the homologous pairs separate? Meiosis one, and what stage? Anaphase one. And then when would you separate sister chromatids? Anaphase two of meiosis two or straight up during what? Anaphase of mitosis, right? And that process, sweetheart, this isn't, this, that, not right here, sweetheart, not right here, not right now, okay? Because we're not going to sign in right now because I'm doing a different review right at this moment, okay, Ben? All right, so when we look at those same microtubules that reach across the cell, these are the same microtubules that make up those centrioles. What did those centrioles look like? What do we call them? They, we call them what? Churros. And they were perpendicular to each other. Do you remember that? And those same microtubules you see in cilia and flagella, but they're not in the 9 plus 3 arrangement. They're in the 9 plus 2 arrangement and 2 in the middle. And then basal bodies anchor the cilia and flagella, and they're in that 9-3, kind of like those centrioles. So those that's more like evidence for evolution. Okay, that's it. Chapter 4. Moving on to chapter five, you already looked at those, okay? But then you have the structure of a cell membrane. Look and see what you can find in the cell membrane. Sweetheart, I can't help you right now. I'm in the middle of a review, baby. Mm -hmm. Okay, what do we see in this cell membrane right here? We have a what? Phospholipid bilayer. What is a phospholipid? It's just a fat that's been modified, right? Normally a fat, you have glycerol and three fatty acid chains, right? You just remove one of those chains and you replace it with a phosphate group. Where else do we see phosphates? ATP, adenosine triphosphate, right? It's the same phosphate group. And now we are making the fatty acid chains, which are hydro are in the center, and then the phosphate groups are hydrophilic. Then interspersed within that to help with the fluidity in animal cells, you will find what to help with the fluidity? Cholesterol, Cholesterol which is a type of what? Steroid. Steroid, right? Okay, and then when I look here, I see these right here. What are those? Proteins. Let's review what proteins can do. They could be what? Channels, carriers, cell recognition, receptors, enzymatic, and junctions, right? They play various roles. Then I see these right here. What are those, those green things? Glycolipids or glycoproteins, but they're both built out of what? Carbohydrates, which means they're built ultimately out of what? Sugars, right? And those help with what? Cell recognition. Remember MHC1, you're done, MHC2. Two, I will help you. That's what you're looking at right there. Okay. Now, then the next part through, I just went through, it's not going, but here it goes. Just talking about all the different functions. Now, what's the difference between a channel and a carrier? A channel, it passes straight through, but a carrier, you're somewhat binding to it. Carriers, if you go against the concentration gradient, are called what? It is called active transport. What, what would you call that carrier? A uh, what? A pump. A pump. Exactly. A carrier that requires ATP to function because you're going against the concentration gradient is a pump. All right. And then what's the most famous pump? Sodium potassium pump. How much of our energy is dedicated to the sodium potassium pump? Yes. 30% of all the ATP that you make 
is helping your sodium potassium pumps. Okay. And then we already talked about this. Okay, it's moving so slowly. Is it up there? No, not yet. There we go. Cell recognition proteins, MHC1s and MHC2s, and receptors. Receptors are the beginning of what? Signal trans. You're welcome, sweetheart. Signal transduction pathways. And then what? Enzymatic. Remember when we looked at the production of cyclic AMP and that G protein? Okay, those are all those things. And then junctions are just different ways to hold those cells together, okay? Then we need to talk about permeability, okay? What can go through a phospholipid bilayer? Anything that's not what? Large, large or charged. If you are large or charged, what are you going to have to use? A channel, a carrier, or whole membrane, endocytosis and exocytosis. Is that familiar? Mm -hmm. If you're going through the phospholipid bilayer and you are water, what do you? What is that called? Osmosis. Osmosis is a diffusion of water from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. If you're going through the phospholipid bilayer and you are not water, but you're still able to go through it, that's just called what? Diffusion. If you're going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration using a channel or a carrier, just going from high to low, what is that called? Facilitated, Facilitated diffusion. diffusion. Anything that doesn't cost you ATP is called passive. Anything that costs you ATP is called active. Give me an example of active transport using a carrier. Okay, have or Endo or, endo or exo whole membrane. Okay, is that kind of clear in your head? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then um, I think I have a whole slide on that. I just jumped ahead. Here it is. Okay, T just take a look real quick. Diffusion is just high to low. Using a protein to go high to low is facilitated. If it costs you energy, it's active transport. You could use a carrier or you could use whole membrane. Okay, then we just go into osmosis. Okay. In osmosis, here's the big ticket item, okay? You have a barrier, you have a membrane, and there's different concentrations of stuff on either side of the membrane. If you have more salt on one side of the membrane than the other, it's going to want to go across that membrane. Do you agree with that? Yes, and as long as the molecule is small enough, okay, and it has a way to get across, it will do that, right? It will move from high to low. But if you have um, water moving from high to low, then it's got a more fancy name, and that is what? Osmosis. And when we start talking about words like hyper, hypo, and isotonic, okay, the hypertonic environment, I always think of like a little kid who is hyperactive. They would have what? A lot of sugar or a little sugar? Water. Yeah, so if you have a lot of sugar, then you probably have a little water. Hypotonic, hypo means low. So you don't have as much sugar, you would have more water. And water must flow from the hypo, right? So when we apply that here, okay, we have a 3% salt solution. If the salt could, it would move out of this thistle tube and into this beaker. This beaker is pure distilled water. What is its water potential? Zero. Zero. That's the best water potential you can be, right? Any time you dissolve something into the water, then the water potential goes what? Into the negative, right? It goes negative. But this water is going to flow from its higher concentration to a lower concentration within the thistle tube and keep going and keep going until what? Gravity is going to push back, right? Just like a cell wall in a plant pushes back. Same idea, right? So here, when we look at water potential, okay, so when we look at water potential in this beaker right here, okay, there's no pressure getting put, no pressure potential put on this beaker, so there's no pressure there, so the pressure potential is zero, but you have enough to dissolve stuff in there that it's dropped the water potential from zero down to negative 12. 
Are we okay there? So mm -hmm. overall, pressure potential plus solute potential equals a water potential of negative 12. This piece of potato right here is also negative 12, even though it has more things dissolved into it. It's more concentrated to the fact of negative 15. But what brings it up to negative 12? The pressure potential, the turgor pressure by the cell wall. Okay. Questions you want to ask me about that? Okay. I have another um, question in here about that, so hopefully that will help you. It's embedded here. Okay. Go. Go, go. Okay. Endoexocytosis, we've hit that. The only thing I need to address is um, on endocytosis, there are three types. What is this one? Penocytosis is cell drinking, right? And that would be like here, okay? And then what do you call cell eating? Phagocytosis is cell eating like a um, dendritic cell eating a bacterial cell. That would be phagocytosis. And then what was the third one? Receptor yes, receptor mediated where it binds receptor, 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 and then it does endocytosis. Okay. Now, looking right here is how to apply some of the things we've talked about in this chapter. How could you figure out an unknown solution molarity if at least you knew they were 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.1? I might have another one over there. Doesn't matter. I have two solutions. They're both clear. One I know has got to be a 0. 0.6 molar and one is a 1 molar. What would I do? I would take those unknown solutions. I put them inside of a what? I'd put them inside of a dialysis tube. Would I try to make the dialysis tube being the same size? Yes. Would I put the same amount of solution in there? Yes. Would I leave some space for expansion? Yes. Because I'm going to put that dialysis tubing in a beaker of what? Pure distilled water. Who has water potential of? Zero. Zero. And I know what's in my bag is a 0.6 or a 1 molar solution, so I know it's negative, right? Because it's got stuff dissolved into it. And water must flow from the hypo. It's going to flow from my beaker into my bag. And I'm going to put them in for the same amount of time, let's say 15 minutes. I'm going to weigh in before and after, and I'm going to take a percent change in mass, yes? I'm going to take final what? Minus initial over initial. V. <laughs> Final minus initial over initial. That's going to tell me how much did my bag change in mass. Who do you think is going to gain more weight? The 0.6 molar or the 1 molar? 1 molar, right? The 1 molar because it's more hypertonic than 0.6 molar. Yeah? So more water. It has a lower water potential. Water always follows from high water potential to low water potential, okay? So it's going to move into that, the percent change of mass. From that, I can predict which molarity it is. Are you okay with that? All right. So then another thing to think about is, is, Did it go yet? It's oh, it's on your screen? Okay, so you see the carrots on your screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how would you figure out the... That's so annoying. How would you... What did I say on there? How would you figure out the water potential of a carrot? Or Okay. So you've done this lab, right? So you would cut up your pieces of carrot, and you'd put them in several different known molarities of solution from zero to one molar, right? 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, right? And one molar solution. Are we okay with that? Did it change yet? Oh, it did, good. And then what I would do is I would do the percent change in mass. Are we okay still so far? And when I would grab that percent change in mass, oh, it's probably not gonna happen. Oh, it did happen. When I graph that percent change in mass, I would assume at the lower molarities like zero, that carrot would what? Gain mass, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the higher, the more hypertonic I made it, it wouldn't gain as much. And in fact, it would start to what? Lose mass. And at the point I would make my graph 
at the point I would predict, I would infer from the data where it would neither gain or lose mass, right? At that molarity, once I know that, do you remember we talked about um, water potential is a factor, right? Of, let's see if it will keep writing. What is it a factor of? Pressure potential plus solute potential. And I know solute potential, and you have this on your, uh, on your uh, formula sheet, is negative ICRT. Does that all sound familiar? So you take negative, I stands for ionization constant. That is for something like sugar, it doesn't ionize, so it would just be one. But it, on the AP exam, they would tell you. But I'm just telling you, if it's salt, salt will ionize into sodium and chlorine, so the ionization would be two, okay? So I, what is the C? The molarity of the solution where the carrot neither gained nor lost any weight. R is a constant, 0.0831 liters per bars per mole per Kelvin. They would give you that, okay? And then T stands for temperature in Kelvin. Right. And so you would be given how to calculate that. But what you're trying, the way this works is where it doesn't gain or lose mass, your pressure potential is equal to what? Where it doesn't gain or lose mass? Zero. Zero. So then you know your water potential is only a factor of your solute potential. And here's the equation to figure out the solute potential. Okay, review that. I gave you other practice problems in here, and I did a super quiz like on organelles, so you can look through those as well. Um, and I would just do, like I gave you some of these that you could do. Do you know the answer to this? Oh, you can't even see it. Or can you see it? What is the powerhouse of the cell? Yeah, that's a terrible meme. Okay, how about this one? Can you do that one? I know you can't see it up here, but what did it ask? What is the structure? Which structure is the site of protein synthesis? Where, where are proteins synthesized? Where? Oh, okay, good. I thought I heard something else. All right. Any big ticket items you want to ask me about for this chapter? These chapters? Okay, go study. Have great weekends. I love you. Make good choices. Make good choices. Make good choices. Yeah. Whoa. Yes. Um, mostly. Yeah, they're both used in reception and communication. Um, but um, are you when you talk about glycolipids and glycoproteins, it's glycoproteins for the MHC ones and the MHC twos. Oh, oh, I need to pause. Sorry, Caesar forgot to pause.